Ephesians chapter 1, we see the church is likened to a body. Chapter 2, a temple. Chapter 3, a mystery. Chapter 4, a new man. Chapter 5, a bride. And chapter 6, a soldier. Uh, Ephesians and Colossians have some similarities. And uh, one, of course, they're both prison epistles. Uh, Paul was in prison. Uh, but it emphasis, Ephesians emphasizes the body of Christ, which is the church, and Colossians emphasizes the head of that body, which is Christ himself. Uh, J. Vernon McGee's introduction to this book of Ephesians, he says, A quartet of men left Rome in the year A.D. 62, bound for the province of Asia, which was located in what is currently designated as Asia Minor. These men had on their persons four of the most sublime compositions of the Christian faith. These precious document, documents would be invaluable if they were in existence today. Rome did not comprehend the significance of the writings of an unknown prisoner. Uh, if Rome had, these men would have been apprehended and the documents seized. And they bade farewell to the Apostle Paul. Each was given an epistle to bear to his particular uh, constituency. These four letters are de designated the prison epistles of Paul since he wrote them. These four letters, uh, while in prison, he wrote them while in prison in Rome, waiting a hearing before Nero. The Caesar at that time, to whom Paul, as a Roman citizen, had appealed his case. These quartet of men and their respective places of abode was the Paphroditus from Philippi, uh, and he had the uh, epistles, the epistle to the Philippians. Tychicus from Ephesus, and he had the epistle to the Ephesians. Epaphras from. Uh, Colossi, and he had the epistle to the Colossians. And Onesimus, a slave from Colossi, had the epistle to Philemon, who, who was his master. So, uh, pretty powerful stuff uh, there. Ephesus is the only New Testament church to receive a letter uh, from more than one Bible writer. John the Apostle also had a message for the unfounded. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Uh, this church had more famous preachers than uh, a lot of churches uh, could even dream about. Uh, they had uh, in the church Paul, Paulus, John, Timothy. Uh, it's been called uh, Paul's third heaven epistle. Uh, Ephesians is the Joshua book, reference as the Joshua book of the New Testament. And no other epistle is our uh, pre-conversion position in the world and post-conversion in Christ so vividly described as in uh, this book. Ephesians provides the most beautiful New Testament passages describing Christ's relationship to and love for his church. Ephesian church was founded by Paul during his second missionary trip. After spending 18 months in Corinth, he visited Ephesus with Aquila and Priscilla. And you can read about that in Acts chapter 18. So Paul stayed there for only a short time but promised to return. Aquila and Priscilla remained in Ephesus where God led them to instruct a powerful Bible preacher uh, named Apollos in the details of the Word of God. Paul returned during his third missionary trip and stayed three years, Acts 19. Uh, and then Acts 20, verse 31 as well. He's later, he was later visited by the Ephesian elders during a layover at Miletus en route to Jerusalem, Acts chapter 20, verse 16 through 38. Uh, gives the most detailed description and presentation of the believer as a soldier of Jesus. Two of Paul's greatest prayers for the church are found here. In Ephesians, it includes the last of three New Testament passages speaking of spiritual gifts. Uh, according to John, uh, through, of course, by the Holy Spirit of God in Revelation, this church 
when we talk about the church in Ephesus. Uh, worked hard and possessed patience. They had high church standards. They hated the deeds uh, of the licentious Nicolaitans. They had their first had left their first love and they needed to repent and return to Christ. Uh, Ephesians, uh, a powerful book when we think about the church and the body of Christ. So the church, uh, first of all, Ephesians chapter 1, the church is likened to a body, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all, verse 23. So uh, verses 1 through uh, 6, it has been uh, the church itself was created by God, but it was planned by uh, God. Paul, an apostle Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you in peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Okay, so He's blessed you with all spiritual uh, blessings, okay? You come short of nothing in heavenly places in Christ, when you're in Christ. According as He hath chosen us in Him, okay, before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame for him in love having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved so there's some uh, powerful things here of course that uh, uh, that, that we see uh, here, but we understand that uh, he planned for, for the church. He, uh, and it was his idea. He created it. Okay, uh, he predestined it. Uh, he also uh, he, as we see, uh, he elected. It. Verse four says, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Before the foundation of the world, he chose the church that we should be what? That we should be holy and without blame before him. Okay? That uh, there be a people called out uh, that would be, uh, that uh, he would impute his holiness and righteousness to Okay, and they would have a right standing before God. Uh, but he predestined the church uh, through Jesus Christ according to the good pleasure of his will, verse 5 says. Having predestined us, and you see that word us, okay, to the church, born again believers, the body of Christ, this uh, age, the church age, just like. Israel, and, and we looked at some dispensations, okay, unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, and he did it this way, according to the good pleasure uh, of his will, okay, why, why did he do it, verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the Beloved. Okay, so he's made us accepted in Jesus Christ. He chose, you could say then, he chose there to be a church age. He chose for in the church age that people would be saved and that, that there be believers that make up this church. And, uh, uh, of course, the way would be through uh, Jesus Christ and uh, by Jesus Christ to himself. Uh, so this was his good pleasure, okay? He's, his good pleasure is the way of salvation, the method of salvation, all those things, okay? Uh, we don't choose the way we're going to be saved, okay? God's chosen that through Jesus, right? Through uh, his grace uh, uh, and 
through uh, saving faith. And it's all done to the praise of the glory of His grace. That His grace would be praised. So that tells you right there that that's another big statement against work salvation people. It's to His grace. It's to God's work. It's to God's grace, okay? Uh, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. He has made us accepted, see, in Christ. Uh, and uh, God's done that. The Lord's done that, see. And uh, so as a whole, as a church, as the body of Christ, okay, and you're part of the body of Christ when you've been born again. Look at verse 7. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Not according to the riches of your good deeds or the riches of your, uh, you know, whatever. It's to the riches of what? His grace. grace. Okay? And uh, so uh, our salvation in the church itself was purchased. It was bought by the Son. We're redeemed by His blood. Verse 7. We're gathered in uh, His name. Uh, uh, we read verse 7. Let's continue reading verse 8. It says, Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So the fuller plan, and uh, part of that plan, of course, is the church age uh, as well, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, verse 11, being uh, predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, whom in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. These are powerful verses, folks. Which is the earnest or the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his Glory. So he's given us the Holy Spirit as our guarantee, okay, He's and uh, to indwell within us. So that in the dispensation, verse 10, of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, okay? So uh, although... Um, Jesus and the life of Jesus, death, burial, resurrection was uh, prophesied, uh, it also had to be fulfilled. Jesus had to actually come and accomplish it and do it. Okay, in the, in the process of time, he came, he did that, he bought, he purchased, uh, so he purchased um, that salvation. And uh, now, in the church age, we have what? We have that guarantee given to us at the point of belief or at the point of saving faith, you could say, or at the point of conversion, all those terms, whatever term you want to use. At the point of being born again, we were given the Holy Spirit of God as a guarantee, okay, uh, for us. Uh, uh, so uh, the Ephesian writer employs this word dispensation, uh, three times, chapter 1, verse 10, the dispensation of the fullness of time. Chapter 3, verse 2, the dispensation of the grace of God. Chapter 3, verse 9, the dispensation of the mystery, uh, translated uh, by the word fellowship uh, there in the King James, uh, the word mystery. Uh, so... Uh, the Greek word uh, for, for this is found 19 times in the New Testament. Uh, translated uh, in the following English word, steward, 
stewardship, dispensation, fellowship, and edifying. Um, it is a period of time during which man is tested in respect of obedience to some specific revelation of the will of God uh, uh, process. Remember we said the Bible says God is the same. He's always the same in person. God is the same in, in person. God's person never changes. He's always holy, righteous, true, all those things. But God, God's way of doing things uh, changes. You can't expect God. I mean, if you, you say, well, God did this in uh, Fred's life, so he's going to do it, in, do it in my life. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Uh, God works. Now, there's certain things that God does always do. But God's will for Fred's life may be different than for mine, okay, or yours. All right. God may call Fred to be a school teacher. You, you see what I'm saying? Depends on which plan he has yes. for each of us, yeah. Uh -huh. In that way, it's a different plan, okay. So in the eras of time, and uh, you had the church age, the ages, and you had uh, the age of God through Israel and things of that nature. Uh, uh, so dispensationalism views the world as a household run by God. This household world, God is dispensing or administering its affairs according to his own will and in various stages of revelation in the process of time. These various stages mark off the distinguishability different economies in the outworking of his total purpose. Uh, and these economies are the dis dispensations. Okay. Uh, but uh, God, in saving us, has predestined us for his glory. Okay. Has predestined us uh, for uh, his glory. Verse 11 and 12, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be, here it is, to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. So that for the believer, for the Christian, for those in the, uh, he, his will is, uh, he's predestined us in his will to do what? To be to the praise of his glory. Okay, that's the key phrase there. Uh, to... to to understand and look out. So he saved you. When he saved you, his plan for you is that you be to the praise of his glory. Um, and uh, it was taught in, in uh, the church is taught, uh, is preserved by the Spirit, uh, the what of the matter, the believer, in whom ye also trusted, verse 13. After that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, uh, and whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that spirit of promise. He seals us. Uh, so seal, in sealing us, it indicates his ownership. He owns us. It also indicates security. Security. Look at Ephesians 4.30. Ephesians 4.30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. You can grieve the Spirit, see, but you can't lose the Spirit. Now you can be filled with the Spirit or filled with the flesh, but as far as the indwelling, as far as all those things, okay, you can't, you, know, you can only grieve the Spirit. And you're going to be, dis we're going to be disciplined. And then it also indicates a completed transaction. A completed transaction. Jesus said, it is finished. It is finished. Okay? And that's exactly what he meant. Uh, verse 14, which is the earnest, the guarantee. Just when you see that word earnest, you write on top of it, the guarantee. Just like if you would go and they say, well, there's a year guarantee on this. Well, God doesn't give a year guarantee. He gives a lifetime guarantee. Okay? Uh, which is the lifetime, the eternal guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption. See, there it is. Until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. 
until the time where he raises that body. Okay, he, you're guaranteed. He's going to all the time until he fulfills is what he's saying. Until he fulfills everything, okay, in you and for you, okay. So he becomes our earnest. Uh, like it's valuable. It's given as a down payment for a purchased possession. He's bought us. He's purchased us. He's given us this guarantee, uh, and this happens at the time of our salvation. Uh, he is called that Holy Spirit of promise because Jesus himself has promised uh, he would come. See, Jesus promised he would come. And here, he, he's the, that Holy Spirit of promise. In other words, that Holy Spirit that our Jesus promised us. Remember, back in his uh, ministry. Okay, so here you see this... Uh, uh, choosing, I guess you could say, of the body and then the consecration of his body. Uh, verse 15 through verse 23. Paul prays that the church may know the God of glory. Verse uh, 17. Uh, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Okay, so... Uh, he prays that we may know God, the God of glory. Now, when we talk about glory, we're talking about His excellencies, His perfections. We're talking about who God is, okay? Uh, so, one of, one of God's glory would be His holiness. Another of God's glory would be His love. God's a God of love, okay? That's glory. When you, when you come into the presence of glory, you're coming into the presence of of the fullness of love. When you come into the presence of His glory, you come into the presence of the fullness of holiness. All those things, okay? Also, uh, uh, with that, as you think about coming into His presence, when you say the word glory, think of His presence. It's the presence of God. The glory of God is the presence of God, okay? So think of that. Those terms there too. When whenever you read about the glory of God in the Bible, you going through and you says talks about the glory of God. Well, it was the very the presence of God. It was the presence of His holiness. It was the presence of His love. It was the presence of His righteousness in that sense. Okay, so uh, that that we may know the God of glory. See, uh, verse seventeen. Then Paul prays that the church may know the glory of the glory of God. Not only that we know the God of glory, but the glory of God. Uh, verse uh, 18, let's pick up there. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe? according to the working of his mighty power. There it is again. It was all, it's by his power, it's by his might, it's by his working, over and over again. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world, but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Wow. So, there, this consecration of his body, or a consecration of you, a consecration of believers, consecration of the church, saints, uh, and uh, and this is wrought in Christ, uh, and uh, it's seen. Christ then is to be seen in the church. Let let me say this: Can it's not one local church that can represent Christ in His fullness. It's not one Christian that can represent Christ in His fullness. But yet you have some Christians who think they they have it all together and they're the 
they are the one representative of Christ in its fullness, if you listen to them. And then there's some churches like that, you know, uh, that they're the full representation of Christ in its fullness. And some people wonder why we have to have, why there's so many churches and stuff, because when you get churches and they sort of, they can become cookie cutters, 